Hello and welcome to Speaking Spirit, where we talk about all things spiritual. Your host, John Moore, is a shamanic practitioner and spiritual teacher. And now, here's John. Hey everybody, we have a... Um a very, very special episode today, um, and I'm recording this in video as well as audio, um, so you can also, you'll also be able to check this out on YouTube once it gets up there, and today I have a very, very special guest, a dear friend of mine, and also uh, a partner in an endeavor which we're going to talk about, which is pretty exciting, um, and we're going to talk all about community, spiritual community, and shamanism, and so stay tuned. But without further ado, my guest today is my friend Mary Catherine Spain. She is, I don't know, I'll let you describe yourself a little bit, but you are a shamanic teacher and practitioner like myself, and uh, probably a bazillion other other things. <laughs> How would you describe yourself, Mary Catherine? Oh, wow. Um, I think from an archetypal point of view, I would say I'm a creatrix because I like to uh-huh. create things, whether it's classes or um, ceremony or um, uh-huh. just a lot of cool collaborations going on in my life right now. I, As you know, John, my background is in shamanic technique and skills. Um, I also have a Reiki background, and in my healing sessions, I tend to sort of mix the two. Um, I I call it enlightened energy work because <clears throat> I honestly never know if it's a shamanic thing coming through or if it's Reiki or if they're just dancing together. I also get a lot of intuitive hits during um, a healing session, and so... Uh, I think somebody described that to me as, oh, you're an intuitive healer. And I was like, oh, well, I've never heard of that before, but (laughs) okay. Um, And so, yeah, I do that. I also am a writer. I've um, written a memoir and a novel. They're not published, but I have written them. And I'm working on a sort of a guidebook that explains and interprets um, the nine pillars of the divine feminine which is the name of my business, um, Nine Pillars Healing. And the nine pillars are, um, I guess you could say, a way to embody the principles of the divine feminine as downloaded to me from Athena. So she's one of my guides. Mm -hmm. And I want to say the new moon in October 2018. Why do I remember that? Because when you get a download from Athena that encompasses the nine pillars of the divine feminine. You don't forget what day it was. And uh, she started telling me that these are the principles that we must, man and woman must start to embody in order to bring not only the earth back to balance, but to bring humanity back to balance. So I went with that and renamed my my business um, from clan of origin healing to Nine Pillars Healing. And so I'm writing that uh, book as well right now. I'm on chapter five. I'm looking at my to-do list over here. (laughs) Up to chapter five on that. And then I also run a small farm with my husband, Michael, here in Hollis, Maine. Yeah, I was going to say, you are the busiest human being I know, probably. (laughs) Um, And um, Creatrix is a good good word cuz you're always you always seem to have something something interesting going on um something different you do a lot of stuff um which i think is really cool and um uh if, if anybody has never sat down to write or try to write a book um gosh what <laughs> what an yeah. under what an undertaking um that is i uh i also have a couple books in the works and um wrote well I wrote something non-spiritual in, you know, uh, 2016 now um, as a co-author. And, uh, wow, what a lot of work. (laughs) We could have a whole other podcast on that process, right? (laughs) Yeah, yeah, for sure. And 
Um, we've known each other at least a few years. Um, I think we must have met in a class somewhere, if, I, if that is correct. I want to, you know, I think it may have been at a solstice gathering at the main Audubon. Do you remember that? Yes, um, I absolutely do remember that. Yeah, it was a winter solstice winter gathering solstice at the ceremony. main yes. Audubon because I had done a... Um, but I think we met before that, didn't we? At um, oh. in one of Dory's classes or something. I don't know. Maybe. Maybe. I don't know. Maybe. But yeah, oh. I was definitely at that winter solstice um gathering at the Audubon. It was it was uh um a fun fun we did a despacho um yes. and there was a big fire in the back. I took some took some cool photos of the fire. There was like dragon shapes coming out of the fire and it was, yeah, um, that was, a, I was, I had never done anything like that at the main Audubon. And I was very excited that they were um, hosting something like that, you know? Yeah. So very cool. Yeah. It's a cool place. Um, uh, so Maine, if you, if you're not familiar, cause we have, you know, people listen all over the world here. Um, Maine's in the Northeast of the U S it's um, very rural and forested. We have a couple of small cities and, um, lots of towns, um, and the main Audubon is just in this really beautiful area in Falmouth, Maine, and um, their facility there is is super pretty. Um, uh, nice place yeah. to go for a hike, and uh, or I guess people snowshoe there, and I don't know if they cross country ski and stuff too. But we, yeah, there was a solstice event with another shamanic teacher. I don't know how many years ago that was. Now there was a few. That, you know, speaking of uh, what we have in Maine here, I I would like to offer, um, I feel so deeply grateful that there's such an active um, and vital uh, shamanic community here in Maine. Um, do you, do you find that it's, it, it's sort of uh, the like, you know, primo top notch as far as shamanic communities go? Yeah, it's so, um, it's so strange uh, given that we are such a small state with such a small population and, um, you know, finding not just the amount of shamanism going on here and the, the number of shamanic practitioners here in Maine is huge, um, but also some really amazing teachers here. Um, yeah. So right. great teachers, great community. Uh, there's lots of events going on here. I have tons and tons of... Um, shamanic friends from Maine and um, I'm glad you brought up the word community because that's what we're gonna that's kind of what we're gonna talk about today but um, yeah when I when I started out in shamanism uh, you know I got this I got a message from spirit it was very clear it was it was actually verbal that said you need to you need to study shamanism and I had no idea I didn't know really what shamanism was or anything and my first thought was I live in Maine. How's that going to happen? I don't live in <laughs> Peru. I don't live in Mongolia. Um, how am I going to learn shamanism here in Maine? And lo and behold, this is a great place to learn shamanism. There's so much going on here. And I know people from, um, so I have, I have students all over the world and I have clients all over the world, um, as I know you do as well. And even in some places in, um, I find even especially in big cities, um, you know, I've, I've, um, students in New York and Las Vegas and, uh, California and clients all over. And they're like, I don't know anyone else. I don't know a single soul who practices shamanism other than me. Um, right. and that feels really weird to me given where, <laughs> given the bounty of community that we have here in our tiny little state. Yeah, right. And I also think that it's probably, you know, not the first thing that you offer to someone when you meet them or, you know, you don't like advertise on a T-shirt. I practice shamanism. It's 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 coming around to, I think, be more readily acceptable and and more importantly, maybe more understood on a a, a vast level of, of people. It used to be, you know, 20 years ago, something that 
you would never, I used to work at a, a medical office. You would never mention at, you know, the office, oh, on the weekends I go drum and, you know, journey and meet my power animal. Like people would be like, what? And I think that's changing. Do you? Yeah. I mean, for sure. It's interesting. The people who, the people who contact me for shamanic services, shall I say, um, come from such a wide background. It's surprising. Um, you know, some, um, I uh, have to be careful I don't give away personal details of, of clients or anything, but um, the, the, the fact that people, people reach out to me for all kinds of things, like I'm, I'm doing a ceremony, I'm not performing a wedding, I can perform weddings, but um, some, I'm performing a ceremony for a wedding um, later this year, and you know, as part of the whole wedding weekend thing they wanted somebody to come up and do a ceremony and blessing and that sort of thing and this is like somebody who's an ad exec from the you know f- not even from this state they happen to be getting married here and you know s- people f- people from all walks of life now are are learning um it's not just us weirdos in the woods with our drums and and that sort <laughs> yeah, of thing exactly. and um yeah, it is, it is becoming well. It is becoming better known and more widely accepted. Uh, it can be a little hard for people to get their brains around because shamanism isn't a religion, right? So people want to because it's spiritual and it is very involved. It it is my my spiritual practice is shamanism. Um, you know, yes, there's stuff blended from my ancestral cultures in there, but you know, it's not it's not like I go to church and there's an organized thing and so that can be a little hard for people who grew up in a western world to get their brains around a little bit where our spiritual life tends to be very separate you know i grew up going you know going to church on sundays right with my grandmother and then with my mom and um that was it right that was your that was your spiritual thing mm-hmm. that you did two and hours so you got, on Sunday. You got an hour of spirit every week, right? Right, right. An hour to two of spirit every week. And then you, you know, went home and, and ate a roast beef or something, right? That was, that was kind of, that was kind of, it. Dinner, yes. oh my God. Yes. That was kind of it. And I know tons of people who that's their, you know, that's still how they are, but that's normal for, um, you know, kind of, I don't want to say how I grew up in a normal world. I don't want to say like my way is the way, but in my experience, that is a very normal experience in this culture that, um, that, you know, that's kind of it. So for something, you know, for people who don't know, when you get into shamanism, it starts living through you more than you're doing something. Right. Yes, absolutely. It's definitely more visceral. And there's um, like I, I am fond of saying the church is the land. Like when I mm-hmm. walk, walk my land, um, that mantra always comes up. The church is the land. The church is the land. The church is the land. And it makes so much sense to me. It's, um, you know, for thousands and thousands and thousands of years before um, Jesus showed up, they were worshiping outside and it wasn't just Sunday at 11 o'clock. Um, it was for several occasions and of course seasonal, um, things would happen, the stars, all kinds of interactions with the natural world in a dynamic way that created what, you know, the spiritual juice of their lives. So I'm, that resonates with me. I feel, um, you know, I too was raised in a, a Baptist and both Baptist and Presbyterian um, household in North Carolina in the seventies. Mm-hmm. So uh, yeah, we, <clears throat> we went to church every week, if not twice a week, sometimes there was Wednesday night, you know, fellowship. Mm-hmm. And, um, although I don't go to church now, I'm actually so grateful that as a child, I got, um, the foundation that being spiritual was important. Like that was something that, that we would not be sacrificing 
You know, like my dad would have to be really, really, really sick not to go to church. We were there every week. Mm -hmm. Um, And so it imprinted on me that, you know, paying attention to devotion and sacredness and song and ways to pray and ways to do fellowship, it, it did imprint me hugely. So I'm, I'm grateful for it. Yeah. Um, I I am as well. And, um, though I don't, you know, I don't go to church. I don't identify as Christian. I, I certainly appreciate my, um, my, my Sunday school background. My grandmother was, um, a Sunday school teacher. My mother is a Sunday school teacher, um, where, where she lives now in the South. And, um, my grandmother was a Sunday school teacher. She had a great deal of influence on my thinking about, um, spirituality. And I've told this, told the story before, you know, my grandmother, um, one of the most influential things anybody had ever said to me in my life about spirit And my grandmother is a very, very religious person. Um, Somebody asked her about heaven and hell. And um, she said, you know, when I'm, when I'm angry with somebody, when I'm feeling hateful feelings, when I'm, uh, you know, just, uh, just not, you know, treating somebody, another person like they're a human being and, and whatever, that's, I'm in hell then, like that's hell for me. That's, you know, right, right here, right now. But when I'm kind and when I'm loving and when I'm, um, you know, being beneficent towards other people, that's when I, I'm in heaven right here, right now. And so I, you know, wasn't thinking about the, oh, I'm going to get my reward when I'm dead kind of thing. Um, it was very much about how um, we create heaven and hell for ourselves right here in this lifetime. Oh. So beautiful. Oh my God. I love that. I'm, yeah. I've got a tear in my eye actually. Just <laughs> yeah. And, and my grandmother's about to turn 106. So she's clearly oh. doing something right. She, I will say, here's the secret. Um, never, t- I don't, I don't, I don't, don't know if this is a secret, but never touched a drop of alcohol or smoked in her life and eats oatmeal every single day for 106 <laughs> years. So I swear they should have the Quaker Oats people should sponsor my grandmother. <laughs> yeah. And say, definitely. 100, wow. 106. Um, yeah, she'll be 106 Good next month. Good for her. Crazy. That's some longevity right there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I hope I'm just, you know, fingers crossed. I got those jeans. Um, <laughs> I'll be around for a while. Um, right. But one of the things that I noted that, um, you know, just coming back to community that was always really important for my grandmother and my mother who are big churchgoers um, was, yeah, you go to the service, you know, whatever, and you do your Bible study and all of those things. Um, But it was, it was a social outlet or it is a social outlet for them. And it is, it is a community. And I know, so my mom lives, um, you know, my mom lives in South Carolina. I live in Maine. It's quite a, quite a long distance. Um, and, you know, she's obviously older. She's in good health and whatever. But my stepdad's had some issues. My grandmother lives with her, has had certainly, she's 106, and has had issues. And I would be much more concerned and worried about her if she didn't have the community of her church around her. Yes. And so yes. these are people who will, um, you know, in an instant drop whatever and come to help if, if help is needed. And there are people who will, you know, if my mom's doing something, we'll look in on my grandmother or, you know, all of these kinds of things. And when my mom lived up here in Maine, you know, that was a huge, huge community. And I always liked that part when I went to, um, when I did go to church, I, I wasn't as, as, I liked sleeping in on Sundays. I wasn't always that great about it when I, especially when I got old, when I was a kid, there was no choice, but when I got older, I liked to sleep in. Um, But uh, I like the fact that there was that component, like you went and you did the service and there was always, um, you know, uh, what did they call it? Fellowship. There was always fellowship afterwards where people gathered and, and just talked. And I don't know, um, you know, I don't know how people do shamanic gatherings in other places, 
But around here, there is always that component. There's always the, we're going to eat lunch together. We're going to um, hit the snack table to get mm-hmm. snack tables are big in shamanism, by the way. Um, always have, always have snacks and spirit loves chocolate. That was tell people. Uh, yes. Yes. Um, I was just thinking, John, while you were talking about community, um, my good friend, Paul, uh, who lives right around the corner here in Lemington, <clears throat> he and myself and Amy, who all studied with Dory Cody, our main, one of our main teachers here in Maine, <clears throat> Uh, Paul and, and I and Amy decided that we would create a monthly group that would meet so we wouldn't have to um, keep going to, to, you know, pay different teachers um, to, to sit in circle. Like it was yeah, yeah. the idea of like we're going to create um, a learning space, but also the fellowship space. We're going to base it on shamanism, meaning the prerequisite was that you had to to know how to journey Mm -hmm. and um, you had to be able to physically get to Lymington because we met at Paul's house. Um, He lives on a beautiful piece of property. I don't know if you've ever been there, John. It is gorgeous. One side of the property is the Ossipee River, Mm -hmm. and it meets up with the Saco. And so uh, we called the group Confluence because these two rivers converged with each other in a confluence. I'm getting chills just talking about it because it was a very powerful spot to hold, you know, sacred space and and time together. So we would meet on Sundays at um, 12. And we would end around 2.30 or 3. We'd have an opening fire. We would have counsel and check-in. We'd do a journey or maybe two. We'd talk about the journeys. And then we would eat. It was a potluck. Everybody yeah. brought something to eat. And, oh, my goodness, it, it was amazing how how big it grew. Like, that was in November of 2012, and although I don't go every single month anymore, that group is still going strong. Wow, that's that's amazing. Yeah, that is amazing. Yeah, very cool. Very cool. Yeah, yeah. And, and so eating after you do a bunch of shamanic work, it I feel like it not only grounds you when we commune with each other um, when there's food involved. We are like nourishing our bodies, but also doing something that everybody needs to do. Like we, um, it's relatable. Like I Mm -hmm. brought this, how did you make that? Oh, this is so tasty. Oh, you know, like it's, uh, it's the glue sometimes, you know, food is love, right? Food is love. Well, I also, I think about how many, um, how many spiritual traditions involve the uh, in, involve food, involve eating, right? Eating or drinking or both, um, <coughs> from communion um, to you know traditional feasting to um, uh, what do they call them blots in um, uh, Scandinavian um, religion to uh, you know all kinds of things that involve. Uh, feasts, right? Feasts are a big deal, have always been a big deal, pre-Christian, Christian. Christian. Um, Mm -hmm. There's the breaking of fasts in um, Islam. There's the, and I forget what that is called, Um, in uh, Judaism, certainly there's the Passover Seder. There's all, you know, all kinds of sacred traditions have uh, the sharing of food or some sort of consuming something, eating something as part of spiritual practice. And I do think that it is one way to embody um, spirit, that the the food that you're sharing in obviously in communion gets transubstantiated right into the actual body of Christ and blood of Christ. Um, but it, it's imbued if when you're sharing a meal after doing something sacred, it's imbued with that energy as you describe it. You're nourishing your body and you're nourishing your 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 spirit as well. Cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I want to go back and to the I, idea I of, to, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. I was just saying, I, and I love to cook. So it's always <laughs> fun to show up with something that 
I know is like one of my, you know, favorite recipes or something that now uh, came out of the garden. In fact, John, you would appreciate this. We're starting a YouTube channel for the farm and the videos are me making recipes from items out of the farm share box. So like oh, you get fantastic. the farm share box. Yeah, people yeah. get the farm share box and and they're like, oh, what am I going to do with collard greens? Mm -hmm. So now they there come the box comes with a QR code um, that takes you to our our YouTube channel, and I'm cooking uh, kitchen. Um, so it's it's a, a a live recipe, if you will. That's yeah. that's brilliant. I love that. Um, I'll have to check that out because I I don't think I've ever cooked collard greens so. If you have a collard green recipe, I will uh, uh, definitely check that out. And I'll say that you make a mean puttanesca. We had um, puttanesca at Mary Catherine's not that long ago, and I, I was she gave me a jar to bring home, um, which was delightful, and I got to share with my children who w were like, "This is awesome! You ha you have to um, you have to figure out how to make this." So um, so thank you for the puttanesca. <laughs> I am happy to share that recipe. It's really easy. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. My kids were they're like, "This is so good." Um, so it was it was great that I got to share that with them as well. I bet your girls like the uh, the little spice factor in that one. Did yeah. they like the spice? Yeah, yeah. They they do like. Um, it's interesting. I I always like spicy food. Um, uh, I can't eat it as spicy as I used to now that I'm getting older, but um, the girls like super spicy stuff. So, um, yeah, they do like the, the spice factor in there. So anything like puttanesca or fra diavolo sauce or, you know, whatever is. Gosh. Yeah. I can't do that one, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, we started them when they were when they were first able to eat solid food. We started them on. Um, uh, on Indian food quite early. So they got used to um, having Spice. lots of different spices and stuff. And of course we always had their, their half Filipina. So they um, lots of Filipino food as well. So it's good stuff. Um, but I want to go back to something you mentioned, just the idea of uh, sitting in circle, right? And some people might, uh, you know, obviously you can uh, get the idea of people sitting around in a circle um, but when we just, when we say that in, you know, referring to like a shamanic gathering, when we sit in circle and, uh, well, I'll just add that, um, it doesn't always have to be physical. You can sit in circle virtually and at a distance from people. And, uh, but anyway, I want, I wanted to ask you to talk a little bit about what it means to sit in circle um, hmm. not just sit, sitting physically in a circle, but what, what do you do? Like, what do you, what's, um, and I know, but this is for my, you know, obviously I've sat in a few circles, but, uh, this is for people who might not know. Right. Uh, a couple of things come to mind, actually. First of all, I think when you create sacred space, we all have our, you know, particular protocols and rituals to create sacred space. Um, for me, that would be, burning some sweet grass and sage or maybe some uh, sage and cedar. I was told once by an elder over in New Hampshire, a Native American elder, that to balance the masculine and uh, feminine principles inside, you want to burn sage and cedar together. And I did not know that. The cedar is for the feminine and the sage is more masculine. So yeah. now, um, after that <clears throat> conversation with Grandmother Sasa, I try to burn sage and cedar together. Anyway, I then, you know, call in the directions, and that sets the space for, um, you know, the deep dive, the speaking from the heart. And that was the other point I wanted to bring up. I just took a training with Animus Valley Institute that – focused on the art of counsel, which, you know, people have been sitting around in circles for long, long, long time, eons. Mm -hmm. And again, Native American tradition counsel is speaking from the heart, listening with the ears of the heart, uh, being brief, and then being spontaneous. So those are the 
the four cornerstones of counsel the way that I just learned it um, from the Animus Valley Institute. Um, so I kind of have started to incorporate that with uh, at least check in because sometimes, mm-hmm. you know, if you have a big group of folks sitting around uh, for sacred space and maybe you're going to do a ceremony, maybe you're going to journey together. Um, you do want to do a little bit of check-in because, uh, you know, it's rough sledding out there. People have a lot on their mind Mm -hmm. and you have to clear that out in order to show up more soul filled, show up more able. And, um, I want to say vulnerable to, to take your rightful seat at the spirit table. Like, um, the guides want the full you. And so if you come in with, a a bunch of frustrations and complaints and maybe you're tired, you know, you just have to do that check in to to get things off your chest um, and off your mind. And then something sort of settles right after check in, you Mm -hmm. move into a different speed, a different mode of communication and, um, and relating to each other more importantly. Right. Um, Yeah. What, what do you think? Yeah, so I um, so I think a lot about ceremony. I'm I'm a bit of a ceremonialist, and then one of the things I love to do is is design ceremony and um, and rituals as part of ceremony are really important. And as you alluded to, there are a number of rituals that are performed in the ceremony. I guess we could call the overarching structure of a shamanic circle as a ceremony. Um, and there are rituals in there. So the first is setting out sacred space. So that is both um, saying this area that we're sitting in is now an area where we're doing sacred work. The time that we've entered, we've now begun to do sacred work. So this really, for me, sets the psycho-spiritual tone that we are about to do something sacred. It's why there are, you know... um, you know, in, in almost any spiritual system where there is devotional work or anything like that, there is a separate space where that's done. There's a church, but even within the church, there's an altar and there's, you know, a dais and, um, you know, all of these things. And so there's so there's that. There's the setting, setting up of sacred space as a way to sort of set intention. Okay, now we've stopped... We've left the ordinary world, and now we're entering into the the spiritual world, and we're using the metaphors of time and space to work with our psychology there. Um, and you made a really good point about check in. So, if people don't know what 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 happens in a lot of circles is we'll just go around the circle. Sometimes someone will pass a talking stick or, or something, and um, people will just take turns saying usually what's going on with them. And, and it, um, particularly if you're a group that meets regularly, you, you know, you're checking in with each other. This is what's going on with me. Or if it's a group that's never met before, for sometimes you'll introduce yourself. I'm, you know, my name is John. I'm from here, blah, blah, blah. And I think, um, you hit on something really important here. It's, um, it's another way to kind of unburden, un unload un sort of like, okay, now we're going to do something sacred, but I've got all this junk going on. I need to um, get it out there so that I can set it aside for a moment. And I'm reminded of, so I trained in, I trained in martial arts for decades. I taught, I taught for a couple of decades and, um, you know, we, we would always bow in when you come into, I study Japanese martial arts, you bow when you come into, you take off your shoes Super important, right? You don't wear your street shoes in the in the training area. That's not just for cleanliness. It's symbolic of I'm leaving the outside world over here with my shoes. I'm not tracking in the energy of the world into this space, which is sacred. And now I'm bowing in. I'm beginning and, and entering into sacred space. So there's sacred space that's marked by physical location, it's marked by a specific time period, and it's marked by behavior. And there is a setting aside of the yes. stuff. 
So- that's really, that's, I love that. I, I love um, Japanese culture anyway, and I love the idea that your shoes are going to track on energy. I've never actually thought about that. That's really interesting. Um, I also wanted to say while you were talking about check-in, it also gives people that are listening an opportunity to witness. I feel yes. like with our modern culture and, you know, the cult of me and all of the, you know, dizzying selfies and all of this business about sort of, um, I don't know, the superficial visuals that we are inundated with. People have lost the art of deep listening and, um, and witnessing like just sitting and listening to someone's story or where they're at um, builds your compassion muscle, right? And mm-hmm. to to not sit there and think about, oh, what am I going to say when it comes to me? Like, just to truly drink in another person's um, reality and what they're sharing, hopefully from their heart, right? Like, the check-in is not only about unburdening, like, oh, what's going on with me in my life, but things that are deeply troubled to people right they can they can share that in that sacred space now that we've set the sacred space it, things can be said that you you can't just say in passing in other um you know venues so the the deeply deep deep listening and and witnessing i feel like creates a certain energy in the group and allows other people um as they listen to dive even deeper to reveal even more, you know? Yeah. Um, I feel like we could do an entire podcast episode on witnessing and probably we should at some point because it's, it's, um, it's an incredibly important topic and the effect of witnessing on both the person being witnessed and the person doing the witnessing is you you almost can't describe how powerful an effect this is. It seems really strange, but just being fully present with somebody. And as you alluded to, it's not that easy in today's world because we don't do that. We're in, you know, most of us are inundated with social media, like these, just these sound bites and we're listening to respond and the world is so fast. We don't just sit around and listen to each other's stories anymore or that often, uh, most of us anyway, in the world that we live in. And, you know, just speaking from the heart and speaking one's truth to people who are just accepting without judgment and sitting and holding sacred space. And one of the things that um, I learned from our, our the teacher we have in common, Dory Cody, is in circle, we don't rescue other people. So I might be having an incredibly emotional share, right? Something might have come up, even not just in the, in the um, check-in, but even, you know, as we're doing ceremony or something, I might completely break down crying in the, you know, and just be a mess. And our instinct as good, caring human beings is to rush in and rescue that person. Oh, you're going to be okay and pat them on the back and all that sort of thing. And while that's good intentioned, um, that's also disempowering. It's also taking away this person's saying, you know, oh, you know, clearly it's not okay for you to be emoting this way and I need to fix that for you. I'm going to come here and I'm going to rescue you when most people don't need that. But when you hold sacred space for them to rescue themselves, essentially it's so empowering and it goes, the, the act of witnessing goes way, way beyond that. It's just, it's just this beautiful, powerful thing. And so I'm very, um, uh, I, I definitely want to talk, talk to you more about, that I think we could probably do more than an hour. <laughs> we could probably do a class on witnessing alone. Um, yes. And I will add to that the training I just referenced with Animus Valley Institute. Um, it was part learning about counsel uh, and also <laughs> the art of mirroring, which is basically based on 
witnessing, you know, hearing someone's story and in mirroring you tell their story back to them from uh, the most mm-hmm. compassionate place from, from if you can add in some archetypal energies or, or, um, imagistic language, you know, poetry, like you tell it back to them and it is so powerful, John. It's so powerful because first of all, the other person that has told the story, hearing their story as spoken to someone who has deeply listened to them, it's, it's a very healing technique. It's unbelievable. And, and the story doesn't have to be anything, you know, extraordinary. It's the fact that someone listened to your story so deeply and is now going to tell it back to you Mm. with little nuggets and metaphors that maybe you didn't see as the teller, right? Oh, it's so powerful. Yeah. Oh, wow. I'm now I'm, you know, I've got goosebumps from, (laughs) from hearing that I could, I can totally see that. And It, what you know one of the things that I think gets communicated there is this sense of um you are important, your story is important your um you are worthy of me taking in your story in a deep way um and we don't always communicate that, and um that is you know for anybody who comes from a therapeutic background. Um, there's research that something like 85 to 90 percent of the value of talk therapy comes actually from the relationship with the therapist. It, the techniques, you know, doesn't te- techniques schmeck meeks. I don't know, um, right? It's it's not the you know the yeah that's that's important, but having somebody who deeply listens without judgment. And I love the idea of mirroring. I definitely want to learn more about that. Um, that just sounds like such a beautiful, wonderful um, practice. And and the the phrase "holding counsel," I just i i love I love every bit of that. Yes, yes. And in fact, I can't I can't wait to go on my next level two mirror training because uh, ideally, uh, I would like to be a guide, like be. Mm-hmm someone who brings people here to Avalon and um, sets them out in, in nature to have an encounter with uh, mother earth and then come back to circle, tell the story of that encounter and then be the guide, be the mirror to, to tell it back to them. I've sat in several circles like that with a couple of my mentors Um, it's just, it's a game changer. It's so powerful, so deep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I love the metaphor, the metaphoric work as well. Um, we, uh, there's, um, uh, I don't know why I, I keep, keep coming to this, but there are, um, there are a number of therapeutic models. One's called ACT and I can't remember what that stands for. I know A is acceptance and something, something, but, um, basically it takes, the, it takes the standpoint that um, humans actually learn through metaphor, right? We learn that through metaphor and simile, like this is like this. Like one of the universals, um, th- there, there aren't a whole lot, there are archetypes and things that are universal, but there aren't a whole lot of sort of uni- completely universal metaphors. But all human beings um, in every culture and every language have a structure where something big is something important, right? So bigness mm-hmm. and importance go hand in hand in every culture and every language. And part of that comes from us being fed by adults as babies and saying like, this is the source of our nourishment and these are people who are bigger than me. So things that are wow. big are important. And it's it's almost so obvious that that it's easy to overlook that. But that's actually how we begin to learn everything is that this is like this. So there are all of these um, association, association, yeah, associated, associated memory, associated, that sort of thing. So when you can walk into somebody's world with metaphors, even if they're not their own metaphors, even if you are adding metaphoric and archetypal 
is which is why archetypal work is so powerful because it is archetypal because every it's stuff that everybody has and i actually I, think the role of shaman i actually think um the role of shaman is archetypal the there is a shaman archetype um because it seems the the role of shaman crops up um, throughout time and through, you know, across the, the word is not the same word in every culture, shaman, you know, different cultures have different words for that role, but that role is so important and it crops up and it crops up under the same circumstances that I actually think it is archetypal. I think it is a very human, um, endeavor shamanism. One of the reasons I love it so much is that it is so universal. Um, it appears to be something that, that crops up in, in, pretty much every culture at some point, even if they aren't still practicing, they did at some point. Yep. That, this whole thing reminds me, John, of um, a message I received the other night in one of our journey circles with Shamandi um, that, and I can, I can share this because it was my journey. The Celtic or Welsh poet Taliesin came mm-hmm. to me in the journey and he said, all shamans are storytellers. And I was like, I was like, of course, like to really share wisdom. If you want to infuse someone with wisdom, if you want to wise point, I call it wise pointing, you tell them a story because you, well, first of all, that draws them in. Mm -hmm. And I feel like anecdotes have uh, just powerful ways to allow people to connect on that level that you're talking about, that association metaphor, you know, all of those things are universal. Um, and so I love thinking about every shaman as a storyteller. Yeah. I, I, think I agree with that. I'm totally down with that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm down with that as well. Um, yeah, there are, and, and um, I mean, I love stories anyway, but um, particularly the ones that make me laugh. Like if there's even even if the topic is very, like really serious and um, I don't want to um, I, I won't I, I can't share this actual story because it's not mine. But um, the last time I saw our our teacher, Dory, in person, I mean, we've we've talked to her over video, but the last time I was in her space, um, she told me a story um, about being with her mother when her mother died and it had such a funny ending that I bet <laughs> that I belly laughed, even though it was a very serious moment of, you know, what was happening at the time and whatever, there was just this poignant, um, there was, there was just this poignant moment in the story that made us, there were a few of us there that we all just started belly laughing it was it was it was just a hilarious moment, and I um, actually the 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 line that she told me that came from her mother, and I won't I won't repeat it because again it's her story. I'm like that should be the title of your memoir, actually. So I, I don't <laughs> I don't know what it, I don't know what the title of her. I know she's writing her memoir, which I'm I'm anxiously waiting for, but. Um, uh, again. Here next week, so I'm very excited about that. I'll ask her. Ask her how the memoirs <laughs> memoir is memoir. Wow, that's my my mouth is not speaking French. Sometimes my mouth can speak French, but not today. <laughs> yeah. Memoir, yeah. So, speaking of community, um, we've mentioned shamanity a few a, a, a couple times, and I you know I want to not just be this complete pitch fest here, but I do want to talk about it because um, I'm so proud of what we've done and what we're doing and the community that's growing up that I do want to talk, I do want to talk about it. And um, if anybody's, if anybody's interested in, in this, um, you know, if you practice shamanism at all, um, definitely I'll put a link in the, um, in the show notes for you to follow through, but it's, it's shamancommunity.com pre- pretty straight pretty straightforward. Um, but let's talk about this. Let's talk about the idea and also where the idea came from. Um, and, uh, you really, um, you really like push, push things forward and sort of started this idea. And then I was like, well, I've got some, I've got some nerd skills. I can put some technology together and stuff, but let's talk about what, what it is and where it started and why we're, why we're really proud of it. 
I am so proud of it. And it's funny, I was just going to offer another class. John took one of my uh, classes in March um, this year on Zoom. It was called Click My Heels. I just needed community. I was craving Mm -hmm. community, and I had a few things I wanted to try and teach. So, um, you know, I just opened this class, and then when when the class was over, I was like, oh, where, you know, where's my Thursday night peeps? You know, how can I recreate this? So I had the idea of maybe doing a, a bi-monthly class, ongoing bi-monthly class. But I, I really wanted a co-host. I didn't want to do, do it all my own. <clears throat> I wanted a collaborator. I think as we move more and more into this age of Aquarius, um, Aquarius rules groups, uh, uh, rules what is best for all is the best and and not you know uh, the this these solo ventures are sort of going by the the wayside um so i wanted someone to collaborate with and i i put the call out in my newsletter and john got back to me you got back to me john and i was like yes um (laughs) and so we were sort of off and running on this project of creating not just a class twice a month, but rather an online community of shamanic practitioners and students of shamanism, people that were just getting turned on to it to create, um, you know, the Zoom temple, the place, the platform, the spot where you can land to read an interesting article, tune in for the journey circle. I have, um, the shamanic coffee clutch on Saturday morning where we have a bit of counsel, just like get things off your chest and let's talk about things that we can't talk about with people that don't understand shamanism. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And um, I love the presentations that we've been doing. I love the interaction that I have seen. I feel like there's a lot of potential there too, that that's really exciting. You want, um, something that is near and dear to your heart to always grow. You want it to expand. You want that broader arc, you know, the long view. And I feel like our platform and our community definitely has that potential. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's been amazing. We only launched it. We're only two months old, really. Um, yeah. And, <clears throat> you know, we were sort of thinking, okay, well, you know, I, and I was thinking when I saw this email from Mary Catherine, I was like, oh, yeah. I mean, I definitely want to do something. And I'm missing community as well with the pandemic. Um, you know, a lot of the events that I would have gone to normally were canceled. And a lot of us were feeling kind of isolated. Mm-hmm. And so I thought, well, instead of just a, um, you know, a biweekly or bimonthly or whatever gathering, let's create a circle, let's create a sacred container for people who practice shamanism, whether they've been doing it for 30 years or 30 days, you know, as long as they have some shamanic training, we're not uh, teaching, we're not teaching intro to shamanism there, but um, you know, there are, there's everything. We have all kinds of uh, events from social stuff like the coffee clutch. We do regular journey circles. So we get together and journey together which is incredibly powerful. Um, When you journey with other people, even if you're not in the same room, um, you get, you get carried on their wave of conscious energy. Um, And the only way I can, well, I'll, I'll tell a, I'll, we'll, we'll tell a little story about that in a second, but, um, uh, but we, you know, and there's also interaction. So you can meet people and a lot of people who are really active, there are, um, you know, people who are my student or your student who have d- joined the community and joined because I don't know anybody other than you who does mm-hmm. shamanism that I can even talk to about having these experiences that I'm having where they, yeah. you know, um, okay, you know, I'm, I journeyed and this happened or I, you know, I doing this and I'm seeing these nature spirits or, you know, whatever, you can't really, you know, as we've, as we talked about, you can't really go to, go to work and sit around the water cooler and say, well, I was journeying the other day and I ran into this troll in my backyard and, uh, you know, you're going to, you're going to get a visit from HR or something. And, um, 
So it, it's it's a space for that, and we do we do practice together, which to me is really beautiful. Like I love the um, I love the journey circles. I love to be together with other people, either journeying or leading leading a journey. And if you have ever if you've ever journeyed on your own, but have not journeyed with other people, it's hard to describe how much more powerful it can be when there are other people journeying with the same intention at the same time that you are, it doesn't have to be the same time because you know, you can get the same effect by watching a recording of a circle. As long as the intention of connecting to the circle is there, it's very powerful. And um, I wanted to tell, there was kind of a funny, a little bit of a funny story that happened one in one of our journey circles. And I was, um, I was hosting this, I was hosting the circle. So I wasn't journeying. Generally, I, I don't journey when I'm hosting because I'm p- making sure that the you know the music is playing and making sure that the recording is going and and just keeping keeping an eye on things um, in ordinary reality. So I don't I don't journey, which is it's nice that uh, Mary Catherine leads journey circles and I lead journey circles because I want to journey with people too. So I can I can um, you know go to Mary Catherine's journey circles and and journey with others and on her behalf. And so we. We, you know, I started the music, we started the journey. And as soon as it happened, like I started getting um, a vision come that came through my head and I couldn't really make sense out of it. And um, so I always have a pad of paper near me and pencils and stuff. And I just grabbed my pad of paper and I drew really quickly what I was, what I was seeing. And I didn't have much of an explanation for it. Um, And then we, so then the, the journey, the, you know, the journey music ended and people came back and took some notes and whatever. And Mary Catherine started describing part of her journey an important part of her journey. And it was, it, and you can, you can, you can say, but it was literally the thing that I just drew. It was. And yes. I'm, and that journey was so powerful. First of all, we were journeying to Prometheus to find our Promethean gifts. So John gave this awesome little mini lecture on the mythology of Prometheus. And then we entered the journey time. We did uh, our journeys while John held space. And I, I, I guess I was due. I went on all <laughs> kinds of tours and had a dismemberment. And um, my dismemberment power animal is a great white shark. And so I was um, in the, at the bottom of the sea sort of, getting (laughs) torn apart and there was this incredible wind that came from the west in the water and I was like how is wind and water and it created this little dirt devil thing that was a, a funnel and it had in the middle of it fire and spirit was like this is what you are. You are the feminine holder of the, you know, the vessel, the watery feminine aspect, but you hold the fire of passion. This is you. And when John, as I was talking about this journey, as, as we were checking in after John holds up his like sketch pad and he's like, this is what I drew. It looked exactly like the thing that I saw. It was, it was so wild. I couldn't believe it. I could not believe it. <laughs> right. And that's the, yeah. that's not to like, this isn't a story for me to brag. Like I'm doing some psychic thing. That's not it at all. Um, what, what happens is that even though I wasn't journeying, we're still connected. I'm still picking up on that energy that's going on in in the circle, even though we're in different geographic locations, but you're journeying at the same time. I'm caught up in that energy. So that vision is just coming from spirit and it's coming from, you know, the energy that we're all, I, I, I do liken it when you journey in a circle to being sort of like when you did that, if you've ever done this thing when you were a kid, when you were in a pool and you got everybody moving in the same direction and it kind of creates this whirlpool and current in a, in a pool mm-hmm. Um, it's kind of the same thing, but on a spiritual level, it's like everybody's creating this vortex of journey energy. And so you're, you're riding this wave that has this, um, 
perpetual motion. And it's one of the beautiful things. It's one of the reasons why I love journeying in, I, I love journeying on my own, but journeying in a group is, even if it's two people, is really, really fantastic. But um, as you add people, two, three, four people, I think the biggest I've done, I can't remember, was um, I did soul retrieval training in Kripalu, and it was a really big group, like 80 people or yeah. something like that. It's really, really, really powerful. And that is one of the reasons to come together in community when you are when you practice shamanism to you know, to, to experience that, to experience the ability to journey as a group and ride that, ride that spiritual wave. I didn't have to, it was cool. I didn't have to do anything. I was just along for the ride. Just, you know, hang, hang 10. Yeah. Yeah, That was really, really wild. And, you know, I was sitting here thinking about maybe it was, um, we're both fond of Prometheus. Maybe it was one of his little trickster moves. <laughs> uh, cer- certainly, yeah. yeah. I mean, Prometheus, Prometheus is definitely one of the pe- penultimate trickster gods. So, um, yeah, totally. yeah. yeah. Um, uh, tricked Zeus and stole, you know, he's very, uh, if you're not familiar, very much like Loki and, uh, and, you know, always tricking, you know, tricking the other gods and, um, you know, do, you know, doing stuff. So, uh, yeah, yeah, certainly could, could be that energy going. Well, we've been chatting for nearly an hour. Oh my goodness. I feel like we've could, well, we could go on forever. Well, you and I know we could go on forever and there's, there's all kinds of things to talk about, but I wanted to, I wanted to sort of, uh, wrap up and, um, just, you know, so, so people can get a chance if they want to, if they want to find out more about what you've got going on. Um, they can check you out on nine, nine pillars healing and it's the number nine, right? No, it's, no, it's, it's actually, spelled out. um, N I N E spelled out. Gotcha. So nine pillars Um, and there's, oh man, I have another, like a writer, uh, website. I, I also edit and, and I'm a writing coach. So that's Mary And if you end up there and you wanted nine pillars, uh, there's a spot on my bio that says, are you looking for healing work? Click here. And that takes you over to my other website. So, and vice versa, if you're on nine pillars and you're like, Oh, I I need writing help. Um, Mary Catherine Spain.com will be there as well. So yeah. So I will link. Yeah. Yeah. I'll link to both in the notes. Um, or if you're watching this on YouTube, I'll, I'll link to it in the description of the YouTube channel. So you can check that out. And if you do, um, if you do practice shamanism, and really the only, really the only um, bar to entry is you, you should already know how to do a shamanic journey. If you, if you don't, if the community sounds interesting to you, and you don't know how to journey yet, go learn how to journey. Find a teacher. You know, look up a teacher. Um, you can, you could contact Mary Catherine or myself, or find another teacher or find a class in your area. Um, I really am fond of learning, learning, journeying from a teacher, whether that's in a, you know, a class or whatever, it's really hard to learn it properly from a book or something. Um, but find a teacher, learn how to journey and then come back and check us out. It's, um, shamancommunity.com. Again, there'll be links in the show notes. It's really, uh, it's a really cool, uh, amazingly cool community that is growing and um, just uh, couldn't be happier about uh, everything there is. There's so much there from for you know content wise, from you know classes to recorded journey circles to prompts to information about self care to just everything we can think of that people would benefit from. And it is it is growing and developing. Like we're we're starting to you know think about doing some. Um, group art projects and and uh, stuff like that. So um, come join, check us out, uh, give us a join. I think you can join with a two week free trial um, just by coming to the page and and clicking sign up and um, check us out for a couple of weeks and come to one of our journey circles and see for yourself how um, how amazing it is to journey with a group of like minded people. So yeah. anything else before we. Before we end, anything you'd like to add or subtract? Other than just, I just want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to chat with you today. And thank you also for all the, the you know, sacred service you, you do 
in the world, John. Oh, um, I, I feel like the the other kind of pillars, the torchbearers, you know, those that are holding the light, uh, rise up. It's time. Get mm-hmm. get out of your shell. Come on out. <laughs> Join the party because the, the time is now, folks. Yep. No time like the present. All right. So uh, I'll sign off. You'll hear my uh, outro and then I will we'll stop recording. You have been listening to Speaking Spirit with your host, John Moore. For more info or to contact John, go to mainshaman.com. That's M A I N E S H A M A N.com. 